to the class of science of living system in this particular lecture we'll be discussing about viruses now being a virologist I always prefer to call viruses as macromolecular machines now as I'm talking to engineers so I should describe that why I prefer to call viruses as macromolecular machines now if you think about viruses viruses are composed of nucleic acids, their genetic materials and along with the proteins which coats the nucleic acid to form a complex which is only composed of nucleic acids and proteins. That means we can consider them as a macromolecular complex composed of nucleic acids and proteins. Now if you think about viruses, all of the viruses have two different phases in their life cycle. One is the non-living phase. Whenever a particular virus remains outside of the host cell, the virus behaves like a dead particle or non-living particle. But the same virus, when enters into the host cell, it starts replicating itself, utilizing the host machinery to produce more and more progeny virus particles, as you can see here. That means the virus has two different phases of its life. One in which the virus remains in a switch off mode. Whereas in the other phase, whenever it enters into the host cell, it get converted into a switched on mode where it starts replicating utilizing the host machinery. So that's why just like a machine, the virus can have two different phases of its life one is switch off and the other is switch on. Now viruses are considered as one of the ancient form of life. Now as you can see I have highlighted the word life and then put a question and exclamatory mark after that. Because just now I have discussed that the viruses have two different phases of its life. In one phase when it's outside of the host cell it it remains in the in the dead phase or non-living phase whereas whenever it enters into the cell it starts behaving like a live cell okay and that's why we can consider it as a simplest form of life moreover as I have just mentioned in the previous slide the viruses are composed of nucleic acids and proteins so Unlike the usual cells which contains membranes, cytoplasms and in case of the eukaryotic cells it contains nucleus and other membrane bound organelles, the viruses doesn't contain any of these. It just contains proteins and the nucleic acids. Okay, So that's why we can consider them as an ancient form or simplest form of life which has appeared in the earth in an ancient time. Furthermore, viruses are the only organism in the earth which can contain RNA as their genetic material. There are different kinds of viruses. Some viruses can contain DNA as their genetic material. The other viruses contains RNA as their genetic material. And the viruses are the only entity in the earth which can contain RNA as their genetic material. No other form of life can contain RNA as the genetic material. Furthermore, all three domains of life, the archaea, bacteria as well as eukaryotes have viruses associated with them. So that means all three domains of life have their corresponding virosphere associated with that domain of life. So that's why it has been hypothesized that viruses may have evolved from complex molecules of proteins and nucleic acids before the cells first appeared on the earth. So if you think about the RNA world, so in the in previous classes we have discussed about the concept of RNA world where we have described that RNA could be the first biological molecule which has appeared on the earth. Why? Because RNA can act as a genetic material can store genetic information 
but at the same time they can also act as enzymes like ribozymes okay now if you think about rna viruses they contains rna as their genetic material along with proteins which protects these rnas so we can say that the rna viruses may have appeared just after the rna world so first the rna has appeared as first biological molecule on the earth and subsequently it got little more complicated to form the viruses which it contains only the rna and the protein and subsequently different forms of life like archaea the bacteria as well as eukaryotes have evolved from their corresponding viruses what is a virus how the virus looks like so first of all we should mention that a virus is a sub microscopic particle okay so we have discussed about different kinds of microscopes and the very basic microscope is the light microscope now you, you cannot visualize viruses using a regular light microscope so that's why sub microscopic particle okay and these viruses can only be visualized through electron microscope okay so these are some electron micrographs or transmission electron micrographs of negatively stained virus particles so this is bacteriophage t4 which infects bacteria this is the electron micrograph of coronaviruses you all know there is a worldwide pandemic which is going on which is caused by coronaviruses so this is how the coronaviruses looks like and as you can see they are spherically shaped along with spike proteins projected outwards from the spheres and this looks like crown so that leads so in in latin the crown is corona so that's where the name come from the coronaviruses these are the electron micrographs of influenza viruses again as you can see spherical shaped viruses along with hemagglutinin and neuromidase proteins projecting outwards and that's where the ha and na okay ha for hemagglutinin and na means neuromidase these are two different glycoproteins which are the characteristics of the influenza viruses and that's where the name like h1n1 or h5n1 all these names comes from different kinds of hemagglutinin different kinds of neuromidase characterizes different kinds of influenza viruses this is a electron micrograph of ebola virus okay so as you can see different viruses can have different architecture different morphology different shapes okay but they can all of them can only be visualized by electron micrographs electron microscopes so in terms of sizes the viruses can be widely varied in terms of their sizes but all of the viruses remains somewhere in between 10 to the power minus 6 to 10 to the power minus 8 so 10 to the power minus 6 this is the range of the bacteria 10 to the power minus 8 this is the range of ribosomes and the viruses falls in between these two categories bigger than ribosomes smaller than bacterias so as we have discussed the virus is a sub microscopic particle uh, to be more elaborate we can say that a virus is a is an obligate intercellular parasite comprising of genetic material which is surrounded by a protein coat and or an envelope derived from the host cell membrane what does it mean so as we have mentioned that whenever virus remains outside of the host cell it behaves as a dead particle or a non living particle so in order to replicate the virus has to enter into a to the host cell so that's why a virus is always obligated to enter into a cell in order to behave as a parasite okay for example in case of bacteria it can it it act as a parasite causes disease but it can be either intracellular or extracellular it can grow in the extracellular environment as well but in case of the viruses it is always intracellular in order to behave as a parasite 
it has to enter into the host cell. That's why viruses are called as an obligate intercellular parasite, which is composed of genetic materials and the protein coat. And along with that, some viruses can have envelope, which are derived from the host cell membrane. No virus encodes or synthesizes their envelope. When viruses infect a particular cell, produces progeny, those progeny viruses while coming out of the cell get a certain portion of the host cell membrane which surrounds their protein coat. So that's why that's why how they get their envelope from the host cell. Remember none of the viruses can express or can synthesize their envelope. Furthermore the viruses can contain genome which could be DNA or RNA. As we have mentioned earlier the viral genome could be DNA or RNA and based upon that we can broadly classify the viruses as DNA viruses or RNA viruses. For example in case of the herpes viruses it is a DNA virus which, which causes herpes or chickenpox whereas in case of the coronavirus the currently undergoing COVID-19 pandemic so the particular virus which is causing that uh, pandemic is a RNA virus. So viruses could be broadly classified into DNA viruses or RNA viruses based upon whether they contain DNA or RNA as their genetic material. Very importantly, none of the viruses on the earth can have ribosome or can synthesize ribosome. They always utilize the host ribosome or host translation machinery in order to synthesize their proteins. Okay. Also, the viruses cannot have any membrane bound organelles. Okay. Unlike eukaryotic cells, viruses cannot have any membrane bound organelles. Also, viral genome directs the synthesis of viral components using host cell machinery. Because viruses lacks ribosome, so viruses cannot synthesize their own proteins. In order to synthesize their proteins, they have to utilize the host translation machinery. And that's why viruses are obligated to enter into the cell so that they can utilize the cellular ribosome to synthesize their proteins to complete their life cycle. So now we are talk about virus classification. There are about 10 to the power 31 number of virus particles that populates earth which is a huge number and these viruses are different in terms of their size, shape, morphology, their pathogenicity, their genetic architecture and that's why it's extremely important to classify viruses into different groups so that we can study them properly. Professor David Baltimore, who is a renowned a pioneer virologist, has introduced classification of viruses. Now, the basis of this particular classification is no virus encodes their ribosomes and hence rely upon host ribosomes to translate their proteins. That means all of the virus viruses should synthesize mRNA that can mimic host mRNA and hence gets translated by host ribosomes. So different viruses containing different kinds of genetic materials opt for different strategies to synthesize mRNAs which is the basis for their classification into different groups. So according to Baltimore classification there are six different groups of viruses. Group 1 is the double-stranded DNA viruses, the viruses which contains double-stranded DNA as their genetic material. Group 2 consists of viruses which contain single-stranded DNA as their genetic material. Group 3, the double-stranded RNA viruses. As we have mentioned earlier, viruses can have DNA or RNA as their genetic material. So group 3 consists of the viruses which constitutes their genetic material of double-stranded RNA. Group 4 is the single-stranded 
positive sense alneviruses. Group 5 is the single stranded negative sense alneviruses. Now what about the positive and negative sense? As we have mentioned in our previous transcription class, the positive sense is basically the coding sense which can directly be translated into proteins. So mRNAs are positive sense. Whereas negative sense is basically opposite of the mRNA sense. That means the negative sense RNA has to get transcribed into positive sense RNA so that they can be translated into proteins. And group 6 is basically retroviruses. Retroviruses are the viruses which can reverse transcribe their RNA into DNA. So this is the overall view of the Baltimore classification. As you can see, there are six different groups of viruses, double-stranded DNA virus, single-stranded DNA virus, double-stranded RNA virus, single-stranded positive sense RNA virus, single-stranded negative sense RNA virus and retroviruses. And as you, and all of these viruses has to synthesize the mRNA which can be translated using host translation machinery or host ribosomes. So you can say that mRNA is the point which is the unifying point for all of these viruses. All of the virus life cycle has to go through this particular common point. That means all of them has to synthesize our mRNA which then get subsequently be translated by the host ribosomes in order to synthesize proteins. Now let's talk about each of the group of viruses so one by one. First is the group 1 which consists of double stranded DNA viruses. So these viruses as I have mentioned contains double stranded DNA as their genetic material. Now once these viruses enter into the cell the viral DNA undergo transcription utilizing host RNA polymerase so that it can produce mRNA which is similar to the host mRNA and hence can easily be translated by the host ribosomes. While the DNA undergoes transcription to produce mRNAs and proteins at early stages of virus life cycle, at the later stage the same viral DNA undergoes replication either utilizing host DNA polymerase or utilizing viral DNA polymerase to replicate their DNA. That means to synthesize new copies of progeny viral DNA. These new viral DNAs along with the newly synthesized viral proteins then leads to the formation of new virion particles. Well known examples of double stranded DNA viruses are varicella zoster virus which causes chicken pox or adenovirus which causes common cold. So the next group is single stranded DNA viruses. So these viruses contain single stranded DNA as their genetic material. Now in order to utilize the host transcription or replication machinery the virus needs to have double stranded DNA because it's only the double stranded DNA that can undergo transcription by host RNA polymerase. That's why these viruses which contain single stranded DNA undergo DNA repair by host DNA polymerase to form double stranded DNA. Now that double stranded DNA can undergo transcription by host RNA polymerase in order to produce mRNAs. These mRNAs then produce viral proteins. The same double stranded DNA can undergo replication by host DNA polymerase in order to form more double stranded DNAs. Subsequently single stranded DNAs are formed from that double stranded DNA which then gets packaged into new virus particles. Examples of single stranded DNA viruses are parboviruses. These are usually small viruses which causes infection in cattle like cats and dogs. Next let's discuss about RNA viruses. So there are three different classes of RNA viruses. The double stranded RNA virus, the 
single stranded positive sense RNA virus and single stranded negative sense RNA virus. Now these RNA viruses synthesizes RNA utilizing RNA as the template. For example, during the transcription, as you can see from this image, the double stranded RNA act as a template for synthesis of the single stranded mRNA. And during replication, the same double stranded RNA act as a template for the single synthesis of the double stranded RNA. Now this is unusual. If you think about our DNA replication or transcription. So during transcription, the DNA act as a template for the synthesis of RNA. So our RNA polymerases are DNA dependent RNA polymerase. So that's why for these viruses, they cannot utilize the host RNA polymerase, which are DNA dependent RNA polymerase for the synthesis of the mRNA or, or for their replication. And actually all of these RNA viruses expresses or synthesizes RNA dependent RNA polymerase, a unique enzyme which only the RNA viruses encodes. So these RNA dependent RNA polymerase can perform transcription to produce the mRNA which then gets translated by the host ribosomes and the same RNA dependent RNA polymerase can perform the role of replication where it produces more progeny viral RNAs utilizing the double stranded RNA as a template. The example of double stranded RNA viruses are rotaviruses. So rotaviruses causes diarrhea and dehydrating gastroenteritis in children of age below 5 years. So in third world countries it's still a major cause of infection of children and subsequently their deaths. So next we are going to talk about positive sense RNA viruses. So positive sense RNA viruses constitutes one of the major family which constitutes of very important human pathogens. For example the current COVID-19 outbreak which is going on is caused by one particular kind of coronaviruses known as SARS coronavirus 2. Other well known examples are dengue viruses which causes hemorrhagic fever and polio viruses which causes paralytic poliomyelitis. Now these viruses contains positive sense RNA as their genome. What, do, what does it mean? So the viral genomic RNA is a sense RNA that means it can directly be used as a mRNA. So usually uh, for our cells the DNA need to undergo transcription in order to produce mRNAs but for these viruses the genome itself can act as a mRNA and hence can be directly translated by the host ribosomes in order to synthesize proteins. Now one of these proteins are viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase and these virus RNA dependent RNA polymerase can perform virus replication where they forms negative sense RNA which then can act as a template to synthesize more copies of positive sense RNAs. Now these newly synthesized positive sense RNAs then gets packaged into new progeny variant particles. The next classes of RNA viruses are negative sense RNA viruses. This is another very important class of RNA viruses which constitutes uh, very important human pathogens. For example, influenza viruses. So influenza viruses causes mild to severe respiratory infections uh, like coronaviruses or Ebola viruses which causes hemorrhagic fever. Now, in this particular case, uh, the virus uh, contains negative sense RNA that means the RNA is of opposite sense of the mRNA. That's why the virus in order to synthesize its protein first needs to undergo transcription to produce mRNAs. Now that is the reason that these viruses along with their RNA also carries their own RNA dependent RNA polymerase. 
So it's not only the genomic RNA of the virus that enters into the infected cell, but along with that, the viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase also enters uh, in the infected cell. Subsequently, the first step of infection is the transcription where it produces the mRNA. This, these viral mRNAs produces viral proteins and one of these viral proteins that is the RDRP then performs the role of replication. So during replication, the negative sense RNA rep gets replicated through the positive sense intermediate to form more and more copies of the negative sense RNA genome. And these progeny viral genomes then gets packaged into new virion particles to produce more viruses. The last group of RNA viruses are retroviruses. Now, for these viruses, they contain a positive sense RNA as their genome. But unlike the coronaviruses or dengue viruses that we have discussed in one of the earlier slides, these RNAs never get translated into proteins. Rather, these RNAs get reverse transcribed into single-stranded DNAs which then subsequently forms double-stranded DNAs. Now, what we have seen earlier is synthesis of RNA from DNA which is known as transcription. But for these retroviruses, they expresses or synthesizes a special enzyme called reverse transcriptase which can perform reverse transcription to produce DNA from RNA. Now these double-stranded DNA formed from the positive sense RNAs are known as proviral DNAs which then gets integrated into the host chromosome. That's why once you get the retroviral infection it will be a lifelong infection because the viral DNA or the proviral DNA gets integrated into the host chromosome and then act as a part or behaves as a part of the host chromosome so that they can undergo transcription or replication utilizing the host RNA polymerase or host DNA polymerase. Well known examples of retroviruses are human immunodeficiency virus or HIV which causes AIDS. So this is the overall Baltimore classification of viruses. Just to recap as we have described all of the viruses unifies at this particular point that is the mRNA which needs to get translated utilizing the host ribosomes. So in case of the double-stranded DNA viruses, they utilizes the host RNA polymerase to synthesize uh, mRNA. In case of the single-stranded DNA viruses, they first gets converted into the double-stranded DNA and that double-stranded DNA can undergo transcription to produce the mRNAs. We have discussed about three different classes of RNA viruses, the double stranded RNA viruses, the single stranded positive sense RNA viruses or the single stranded negative sense RNA viruses. All of these three classes of RNA viruses synthesizes a special class of enzyme known as RNA dependent RNA polymerase or RDRP. These RDRPs can synthesize RNA utilizing RNA as their template. We have also discussed about retroviruses and retroviruses expresses uh, another specialized kind of enzyme which is known as reverse transcriptase. These reverse transcriptases can perform reverse transcription where they produce DNA from RNA. So the positive sense RNA gets converted into the negative sense DNA and subsequently the double stranded DNA which then gets integrated into the host chromosome and subsequently utilizes the host transcription and replication machinery to perform their life cycle. So now that we have discussed all different classes or groups of viruses, we have learned about some unusual genetic features of RNA viruses. So we have 
learned about three different classes of RNA viruses that contains RNA as their genetic material. The genomic RNA could be sense strand that means positive sense or the antisense or the negative sense. These viruses have no DNA intermediate in their life cycle and they encodes a specialized enzyme called RNA dependent RNA polymerase. We have also learned about retroviruses. They also contain RNA as their genetic material. The genomic RNA is of positive sense but they never get translated into proteins. Rather, the genomic RNA gets converted into a proviral DNA with the help of a specialized enzyme called reverse transcriptases in expressed or synthesized by the viruses. So these are kind of unusual genetic features which only the RNA virus possesses. Why unusual genetic features? Because at the very beginning of this particular class we have learned about the central dogma of life which suggests that the genetic information is stored in the DNA which gets transported from DNA to RNA through the process of transcription and subsequently gets transported from RNA to protein through the process of translation. Now in case of the RNA viruses we have learned two new things, two new phenomena. What is that? Number one we have learned that DNA could be synthesized from RNA with the help of reverse transcriptase. That means the genetic information could be transported from RNA to DNA as well. We have also learned that the RNA could be self replicated in order to synthesize more copies of RNA. And the particular enzyme who can perform this function is RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So Professor David Baltimore has discovered both of these enzymes the reverse transcriptase as well as the RNA dependent RNA polymerase and subsequently revised the central dogma of life by introducing these two steps. Number one formation of DNA from RNA through the process of reverse transcription and also replication of RNA utilizing RNA as a template. That means synthesis of RNA utilizing RNA as a template using the particular enzyme known as RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And that's why he got Nobel Prize in 1975. Now originally the central dogma of life was introduced by Professor Francis Crick. The scientist who along with Professor James Watson has discovered the structure of DNA. But Professor Francis Crick has a large number of contribution to the field of science. So it is Professor Francis Crick who in 1956 has introduced the central dogma of life. So this is the original paper by Professor Francis Crick in 1956 at that point of time there was the manuscripts used to be prepared using typewriters and all the images are handwritten. So this is a hand drawn image of Professor Francis Crick where he has shown that the flow of genetic information is always from DNA to RNA and then RNA to protein. Now as you can see he also has predicted that RNA could be self replicated or the information could also be transported from RNA to DNA. So as you can see he has put a dotted arrow in this direction. But at that time nobody knew about the existence of the RNA viruses or the retroviruses and hence the RDRP or the reverse transcriptase were not known at all. But still Professor Crick has proposed that RNA could be self replicated as well as could be used as a template for the formation of DNA as well. So now we are going to talk about virus life cycle. 
So in this slide, I have represented a generalized version of a virus life cycle. It could be a DNA virus life cycle or it could be a RNA virus life cycle. Now different virus life cycles are widely different from each other. Still they should follow these generalized steps. So all of the viruses should follow these steps in order to complete their life cycle. So as we have discussed, viruses are obligatory intercellular parasites. That means in order to complete their life cycle, they first has to enter into a cell. Now this is a free virus and as you can see there is a capsid which is protecting the viral genome and at the surface of the capsid you can see a lot of spike proteins. Now these spike proteins play a very important role in interacting with the receptors present at the cell surface. Now each of the cells whether it's a prokaryotic cell or a eukaryotic cell has a large number of receptors at their surface which play variety of physiological roles. In order to enter into a cell the virus has to interact with the cell surface receptors utilizing its spike proteins and this particular step is specifically known as attachment. So the first step of virus life cycle is the attachment where virus utilizes its spike protein in order to interact with the cell surface receptors. Now upon attachment the virus then enters into a host cell whereby it deposits its genomic material it could be a DNA or it could be RNA into the host cellular cytoplasm. Now there could be two different fates of the viral genome inside the host cell. So at the early phase of infection the genome undergoes transcription in order to produce mRNAs which utilizes host ribosomes in order to produce viral proteins. Now some of these viral proteins assembles in order to form new capsids whereas other viral proteins take part in the replication process at the late phase of infection where it produces more and more progeny viral genomes utilizing the parental virus genome as a template. Now once you have a lot of viral genomes and large number of capsids assembled, these genomes then gets packaged into the viral capsids to form the complete progeny virus particles. Once these progeny virus particles forms, they come out of the host cell and this process is known as release. So as you can see during the virus life cycle one virus genome synthesizes a large number of viral proteins and also a large number of viral genomes which then assembles in order to form a large number of virus particles in one go. So this is distinctly different by the mode of replication of other living organism. For example, if you think about a bacterial cell division, one bacterial cell undergoes cell division process in order to produce two bacterial cells. These two bacterial cells then again subsequently undergoes division in order to produce four, then four produces eight and so on. Same is true for eukaryotic cells as well. That's why if you try to plot a bacterial growth curve, you can see an exponential increase in the number of bacterial cell in the solution. So in this experiment what has been done is a small number of bacterial cells has been inoculated into a culture media and subsequently the number of bacterial cells was monitored at different time points of inoculation. So you can see there is a steady increase in the number of the bacterial cell in the media. But virus growth curve looks significantly different from the bacterial growth curve. Why? Because once you infect certain number of cells with the virus, there will be a time for which you will not be able to detect any virus particle. That period is known as eclipse period. So why there is a lag? As we have discussed in the previous slide that once the virus genome enters into the host cell, it synthesizes a lot of viral proteins as well as a lot of viral genome and subsequently these viral proteins assembles 
with the viral genome in order to form the complete virus particles. So during the synthesis of the proteins and the RNAs, there will be no complete virus particle inside the cell and that's why you will not be able to find a single complete virus particle during this particular time period. Once the new virus particles are formed, there will be a sudden increase in the number of progeny virus particle in the media. So unlike the living organism, viruses replicates by assembly of preformed components into many particles. It's like viruses are using our cells as a factory to make different parts of their body and finally assembles them into large number of progeny virus particles. This is also the reason that we can consider viruses as a macromolecular machines. Just like machines of which different parts are initially formed at different sites of the factory and subsequently all these parts are assembled to form the complete machine. Similarly, in case of viruses, virus proteins and viral genetic materials are formed at different places of the cells and subsequently gets assembled into new virus particles. So for the virus growth curve, eclipse period denotes the initial lag between the initiation of infection and the point when the first virus particle is produced. So during this lag, viral proteins and genetic materials are produced and hence practically there is no complete virus particles either inside or outside of the cell. So now that we know that viruses are just like particles made up of proteins and nucleic acid, the next question is, is it possible to measure the titer of a virus in a particular sample? So the answer is yes. We can measure the number of infectious virus units per milliliter of a sample isolated from patient. For example, you can isolate a nasal swab or a blood or a tissue from an infected patient and subsequently can perform this particular assay in order to measure the number of infectious virus unit in that particular patient sample. This will give you the idea that how much of the virus replication is going on in the patient and hence will give us the measure of overall disease burden in that particular patient. So that's why plaque assay is an extremely important assay. So this assay was developed by Professor Rinald Dalbakko in 1952 for which he got Nobel Prize in 1975 because this plaque assay has revolutionized the field of virology. So this assay gives the measure of infectious virus units per milliliter of sample to either isolated from patient or in a sample of virus which has been cultured or amplified in laboratory. This assay depends upon the ability of viruses to infect and kill cells. Also, it doesn't account for the non-infectious or defective virus particles. So during each phase of replication, viruses generates a lot of non-infectious or defective virus particles. So utilizing this assay, we can specifically measure the number of infectious virus particles and this measurement will not be affected by those non-infectious or defective virus particles. So in order to perform a plaque assay, mammalian cells are seeded in a culture dish to form a cell monolayer. Now what is a cell monolayer? Now if you seed some cells in a culture dish, they usually sticks to the bottom of the surface of the dish and subsequently start propagating in order to fill up the entire surface forming a cell monolayer. Now this cell monolayer is then infected with virus particles. Usually tenfold serial dilutions of virus tox solutions is prepared to infect cells and higher dilutions are used to make sure that one cell get infected with only one virus particle. Now after infection, 
cell monoliths are overlaid with agarose media mixture that forms a semi-solid medium. This actually inhibits the newly formed viruses to come out into the media and infect cells which are far at a distance. As a result, only the cells which are at immediate proximity of the initially infected cells will subsequently get infected by the progeny variant particles. Now let's look into the plaque formation in a greater detail. So if you consider this particular cell to get infected with a single virus particle which upon replication inside the cell will generate a large number of viruses that will eventually infect the surrounding cells. Ultimately virus replication inside these cells will kill these cells resulting in a generation of a hollow space in between the monolayer. Next upon staining of the live cells with crystal violet, a stain that can be taken up only by the live cells will result in the violet appearance of the monolayer with a hollow space in between denoting the plaques. Each of these plaques must have been generated by initial single infection of a cell with a single virus particle. Here is a plaque assay plate where a 12 well plate has been used to measure the titer of influenza virus. The violet background denotes the cell monolayer while the clear holes represent the plaques. Here each pair of the wells have been infected with a particular dilution of a virus as annotated. While 10 to the power 2 to 3 dilutions of the virus killed all the cells in the mole layer, 10 to the power 4 to 5 dilutions resulted in countable number of plaques. Now in order to measure the virus titer, we measure the number of plaques corresponding to different dilutions of the parental stalks. As discussed in one of the previous slides, each of the plaques should have been generated from a single virus particle and could be considered as one infectious virus particle that can form a plaque. Hence, the unit of a virus titer measured from the plaque assay is expressed as plaque forming units or PFU. Now, say for example, if there are 17 plaques in 10 to the power 6 dilution, that means 17 into 10 to the power 6 plaque forming units are present in the same volume of the original stock. Now, if 0.1 ml of virus aliquot was used to infect the cell monolayer, then the titer should be 17 into 10 to the power 6 into 10 PFU per ml. That means 1.7 into 10 to the power 8 PFU per ml. So that is the virus titer in the original stock of the virus sample.